you will know, is one of the sort of, um, I was going to say, grandfathers of, of nature conservation. Uh, and he's, his, um, his, his kind of passion for conservation still pervades through the charity. Um, as an organisation, why are we here talking about beavers? Well, we're keen to see what we call a blue recovery in the, in the UK. And we want to see the creation and restoration of about 100,000 hectares worth of wetlands uh, across uh, all the countries of the UK. Now, we believe that beavers can be a big part of this because they are superb wetland engineers and they are far cleaner, far cheaper and much more cuddly than JCBs. Thank you. I like that analogy a lot. <laughs> Thanks, James. OK, so um, a little bit of housekeeping of how this webinar is going to work. For the next half an hour, we're going to be getting into the meat of the discussion about beavers and climate change. We're going to be chatting to the panellists and hearing from them as to their research and their thoughts about the subject. Then we're going to have a quick tea break for about five minutes or so and then come back and Jan is going to lead us in an interactive Q&A. So please, please have a think during the discussion of some questions that you'd like to ask the panellists. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please do make use of that. Um, we won't be monitoring the chat tonight, but by all means, feel free to interact and say hi to each other. But if you would like your question to be answered and you have a specific question for a specific member of the panel, please do you use the question and answer box because then we'll be able to see it. We'll try and answer as many as we can but as is the way often with beavers <laughs> there's a lot of questions so we'll um we'll just answer as much as we can in the time that we've got um uh, uh please note that with beavers often it provokes quite um a discussion and we understand that often lots of people have concerns and specific questions about beavers in terms of management and perhaps conflict resolution. Um, we won't be discussing that tonight as this is a panel about climate change and the celebration of World Environment Day um, but as Beaver Trust we really do welcome those discussions so if you do have specific questions about beaver management please do get in touch with us via our website and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions and have a chat with you there. So Let's go back to climate change then. This is a huge year for the climate in Britain. In a couple of weeks, we've got the G7 summit happening in Cornwall. And then in just a few months after that, in November, we've got COP26 in Glasgow. And we can't talk about it enough. It's so, so important that we address these problems head on and collaborate as we are doing tonight um, to try and see what we can do about it. And it just so happens that one of the solutions or potential solutions to these problems comes in the form of the second largest rodent in the world, the beaver or the Eurasian beaver. And um, so we're really excited to, to get into the topic now and, and talk to you about that. And we've still got three amazing women of the panel uh, left to introduce you to. You. So I'm just gonna go around um, Hannah, Emily and Roisin and ask them to just come on camera and briefly introduce themselves and then we'll get into the panel. Hannah, would you like to go first, please? Hello everybody. Um, so I'm Hannah Needham. I'm junior director at Heal Rewilding. I'm currently the only member of staff, because as Jan said, we are a small organisation, only in existence for about a year. Um, so I do pretty much everything day to day with Jan. Um, we run it, uh, just the two of us, and we have an amazing amount of volunteers who are helping us with desktop based tasks. When we set up as an organisation, we were um, launching just at the start of COVID. So we've had a very interesting journey. Um, as far as the charity is concerned. But my background is uh, biological research and some habitat management and river restoration before I ended up working for HEAL. So that's me, lovely to be here, thank you. Lovely, thanks Hannah. And Emily, would you like to go next please? Yeah, so uh, I'm Emily Fairfax. I'm an assistant professor of environmental science and resource management out here in California. Uh, my background is broadly in chemistry, physics, and geological sciences, and I feel like when I do my research on beavers, I actually get to use little bits and pieces from everything I've studied. They are so incredible in how many different ways they can affect the environment, and I've been studying them for the last seven or eight years, and I still am just as excited as day one. Amazing. Thank you. And Rasheen. Um, hi, my name's uh, Roisin. I've been working with beavers for over 12 years now, based in Scotland, um, but working all over Britain, um, trying to hopefully restore this uh, species in a positive manner. My background is animal behaviour, animal welfare, um, and I did my PhD in beaver restoration. And most of my day to day is hopefully working uh, in conflict resolution situations. Great, thank you. And um, I must say, it's so cool to see such a, a female dominated panel 
no offense James <laughs> it's quite refreshing um okay let's get into it then so Emily last year you published some astonishingly interesting research and you're based in the states but your research has had a global impact and potentially will continue to do so so Emily published a paper that basically proved that beaver wetlands can act as a firebreak to help protect protect against drought and wildfire. And this came off uh, during the time it was published. It was around um, the really devastating fires in California. And then also the year before, of course, we had the fires in Australia that affected millions of people and species. So Emily, would you like to talk a little bit about your research? You know, what made you decide to do it and kind of what application is it gonna have over the next decade or so of the climate? Yeah, absolutely. So I, before I did the fire study, I had been looking at beavers in drought stricken environments and seeing can these places stay green because it, it seemed like an irrigation system to me when you've got this big reservoir, which is the beaver pond and then they dig all these little canals out into the landscape their little like drip lines it just it made sense like I've seen this in human landscapes so if beavers are mimicking that structure, why don't they do it as well? And they did, and it was great. And I was seeing these super lush, super green wetlands in the middle of three-year droughts, five-year droughts, 10-year droughts. The beavers were just staying like happy and healthy and they basically didn't know a drought was happening. And it follows then, like every time we have a horrible fire season and at least over here, everybody's starting to get nervous for this fall because we're in a mega drought. Um, it, drought is like what leads up to these fires. And so it followed in my mind, well, if these, places with beavers are not being affected by droughts, then they should not be affected by fires either. All of those plants that are hanging out in the wetland, they're never going to dry out and turn into that sort of crispy fuel state that really gets a wildfire going. And so I looked in five different very large fires in the western United States, and I found lots and lots of beavers throughout them. And I was expecting some of the beaver dammed wetlands to make it through the fires, but not all, like we got to be realistic. And then in my study, like they pretty much all made it. It was way more profound of an effect than I was expecting. I thought maybe like a little bit of fire buffering would happen or some beaver ponds would be okay during fire. But throughout all the fires and all the creeks, I saw that on average, these beaver dammed areas were three times more protected from wildfire than very similar riparian zones without beaver. So clearly the beavers are doing a lot of work in that landscape to make it fireproof. And that is important for animals that can't outfly or outswim or outwaddle the flames when you have a wildfire coming. It's also really important from a climate um, adaptation and mitigation perspective. Like every acre you don't burn is an acre that's not going to be releasing a huge amount of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and sort of propagating that, that cycle of climate change is more intense droughts and more intense fires. And so not only are they protecting the ecosystem in situ, but they're keeping carbon locked in the landscape and not sent straight back to the atmosphere to make that cycle more intense. So it's a really cool study. Yeah, it's amazing. And um, I'm curious as to what the reception that you had from the public and kind of the academic community, you know, what were people saying? Were people as surprised as you were? I think uh, people were very pragmatic about it and they were like, well, obviously this is true, but nobody had published anything on it. And nobody had like proven it. So thank you for proving it. Like so many people told me like, oh yeah, I saw this. I have beavers on my land and I've seen them make it through fires, but like, I guess nobody had actually proven it before. And I think that was uh, a really important step to take because when you're trying to work with policymakers or you're trying to, you know, sway public opinion about things, just having that little stamp check mark of peer reviewed, like the scientist has jumped through the hoops to prove that it's good science. Uh, it, it was kind of a big deal for this study. Some people were really surprised. Some people are like, there's no way a beaver can do that. And then I show them these pictures and they're like, what, how did a beaver do that? Um, but a lot of people, they, they did kind of expect it, but they were really happy to see that study. And it did go off around the world. People were like, oh, can I like import beavers to Australia? And I'm like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> um, but then people in places where the beavers are native, like throughout Eurasia, they're like, oh, this is great. Like we're starting to have to deal with wildfires over here that we haven't dealt with the way that the Western US has. And if we can sort of head that off with beavers and beaver restoration, like maybe we'll never become what California currently is, which is a place that is burning intensely year after year. Sure. I mean, it, it strikes me that um, that prevention is so important because often we're so reactive where we wait for things to get bad, then react, and then we can't prevent much further. And it's kind of this vicious cycle. So 
although we do we are affected by wildfires here in the UK but nowhere near to the same extent as you guys are over there in the states so um you know your kind of your research is so um pertinent in terms of us saying okay look we can see that that's having an effect so let's not let wildfires become more of a problem um because here's a, a solution you know beavers do this work for free um it's just part of their natural history strategy um it's it's climate change is so important to try and you know it, we have the gift of foresight i guess in that sense yeah you got to get ahead of it and if you think mm. about a landscape with all these little beaver patches on it it's just it's so much more varied and so whatever kinds of environmental stressors you have whether that's droughts or fires or floods or insects or whatever if you have this patchy landscape, it's going to be more resilient than if you just have a big homogenous field, like one thing all the same. And so if nothing else, these beavers are just increasing that base landscape resiliency against all kinds of climate disturbances. Mm -hmm. And that resilience is so, so important. Um, just going back to the beaver itself, um, Rasheen, Emily was saying how people look at her her photos and say, oh, how did a beaver do that? How does a beaver do that? What is it about a beaver working on a river that helps it to store this water and be this buffer, as it were? Oh, you're on mute, Rishi. Sorry, uh, I was just saying, I'm always in awe of what beavers can do and how rapidly they can do it. So here is an animal with such, well, strength uh, power and I say diligence to really um, construct these um, well structures dams that are so if we had the same material as a human there's just no way we could hold back the same amount of water and it's just it always fascinates me how they do this and they are just so adaptive I mean we know they have to be by the water they quite like wooded areas but you will find beavers in all sorts of places and um, all sorts of things in dams so the the creativity that these animals can can bring and just how ingenious um, and constructive they can can make when they're determined uh, it's amazing what they can do. So now just to say not every beaver will dam and it's not as soon as beavers turn up, you know, their first thought is to flood the area because when they live on deeper river systems or deeper locks or lake systems, they won't always seek to go and dam those immediately. If they've got deep water and access to vegetation and deep banks to, to burrow in, you may never see these damming behaviours. But in smaller systems, especially side tributaries or it can be agricultural ditches, the beaver will seek to regulate the water and um, control flow of water. So, um, yeah, you've got a very determined animal. And sometimes in a conflict situation when we want to do the reverse and take a dam out, um, it's surprising how, how a meeting of minds will happen and sheer stubbornness of uh, how many times I can take a dam out and how many times a beaver will reinstate it almost overnight. So you've got a strong, determined animal that's very adaptive to a surrounding situation and very determined to control the water levels. Yeah, that's so true. And I think it's important to note as well, it's often tempting to think that with such a charismatic mammal that they're doing all of this altruistically and isn't it wonderful of the beaver to do this for us but it's really just its biology and its its ecology and how it's evolved to um, protect their young really to to dam and submerge the entrance to their lodges and then by doing that it creates this wetland um, and there are very very few animals that have that same effect on the on the river environment James talking let's zoom out again and, and look at the wetland um, wetlands in Britain have declined massively over the last hundred years or so. What is it about a wetland habitat that is so, so important to remember when we're trying to look at solving things like climate change and soaking up carbon and all, those, all that good stuff? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. The, um, yeah, since Roman times, we've been doing our, our best across the UK to, to destroy and damage our wetland resource. Um, which is a bit of a weird thing to do, given the number of services that these wonderful wetlands provide us, as well as providing fantastic habitats for, for wildlife as well. So we've seen a huge amount of, of decline, but in recent years, we've also seen a more enlightened approach, I think, really trying to understand what these habitats can do for, for people as well as wildlife. So we know that wetlands are great for, for wildlife. You know, lots of people who are watching this webinar tonight will probably go to wetlands to see wildlife, you know, whether it be fantastic flocks of of geese in the winter or 
you know, wonderful otters and all those sorts of things, you know, as well as the beavers, then uh, people know that these, these places are good for, for wildlife. And where water meets land, it generally is good for, for wildlife. But these other services that um, wetlands can provide and the wetlands that beavers uh, create and maintain are really important too. So we're talking tonight about one of the things that um, is, is, is uh, provided by wetlands when they are kept in, in a good condition, and that is around storing carbon. So we know that when wetlands dry out, that that's one of the big problems. And we've seen that with peatlands, we've seen it with damage to, to places like salt marshes at the coast, where there's a huge amount of carbon lost as a consequence of, of poor habitat management. So, so this carbon uh, storage and sequestration in some uh, um, habitats, which is this kind of, uh, you know, the storing over time of carbon is really important. But there are so many other services that these things provide. I mean, we get a lot of our water from wetlands. You think of reservoirs, you know, although we make them, they are places where we get our water. They help us to manage floods and the natural flood management we're talking about today is, is a massive part of that. But they're also providing things like nutrient uh, um, uh, removers as well. So they can perform all sorts of services as well. And let's face it, when we go and see those wetlands, when we go to that walk along the river or we go to a, a lake, we get health and well-being benefit as well. And that's really important to, to understand that we know these blue habitats are very good for those things. So we should really value these habitats and, and let's start to replumb the landscape with the help of beavers to get some of these wonderful places back. <laughs> and I think um, while you're talking, I was thinking, you know, that there is just something about water um, in that, on the one hand, we all like to be near the water. There's scientific, there's lots of data to prove that water, being near water is very good for our mental health and well-being, as you just said. But then also, I can't help but feel that we're slightly threatened by it as well. And there's something about seeing a, a, a beaver wetland that's sort of flooding into, um, yes, farmers' fields often or over near public land that, um, is a slight deterrent maybe, is that fair to say? Um, and that it's, it's, we need to go back to understanding what that's actually doing and how that's created and what that can do for us. Um, and then that feeds into beaver management techniques and things as well. But um, Rasheen, you've, you work all the time, you're, you're on the ground in the field. Um, what, what what are people saying, you know, that you come across about a beaver wetland, you know, anecdotally, are they amazed by it or sort of um, feel a little bit, I don't know, intimidated by it? It's, it's a tricky one. Yeah, and it, it really depends um, who they are and the surrounding land use. So I would say people are very inspired. You know, you can see as soon as the beavers move in um, and change, uh, it happens it's quite rapid so I think a lot of the people are quite surprised by actually how fast beavers can reinstate a wetland and I think that does take people by surprise and um, I find especially in Scotland what beavers have done is any kind of area that's been drained and if you look at some of the place names you know they're called mosses or locks and you know people have drained it just like Jim said for centuries and the beavers can come rapidly and put back well, if you look at old historic maps, what was a wetland, what was, you know, an old lock, and they can do it as a surprising amount of time. So I think people are inspired by that. And um, I think people are very impressed. And it is a place people flock to, you know, to see wildlife. Now, the other flip of the coin is, if that has been your field, for example, it's not all just about farming. But uh, I mean, in seriousness, we can see crops really get flooded out overnight and that can be a serious consideration so I think either way either pro or negative I think people are, are very impressed by the speed that beavers will reinstate water um, and that's not about a massive flood it can be a slow creep and um, so you go into kind of marshy lands and uh, what we're seeing a lot more here now is flooded um, woodlands which again is a habitat that I think we've lost from Britain and we don't we don't often see it and I just think anytime I've gone to Eastern Europe, for example, you see these amazing flooded woodlands that I think we just don't have here. So it's about new habitats and it's about encouraging people to see and look at land a bit differently where, where it's possible. In other areas, if we don't want beavers to flood out these lands, then that's what the mitigation scheme is for. And that's beaver management has been tried and tested all the way across Europe, all the way across North America, long before we are doing it now in Britain. Um, 
it's a case of accepting change almost, I think. And Hannah, you know, setting up heel rewelding, um, you know, it's it's a really exciting but pivotal time to be encouraging people into these wild spaces and encouraging them to almost appreciate how things should be um, because we've got very used to how things are um, and how things are isn't necessarily uh, great news for the planet. So why is it, why is there this urgency? And we're seeing it this year in the political calendar with G7 and COP26. Um, why is it so important that we have these conversations and that we look to potential solutions like the beaver for, um, for climate change problems? Unfortunately, as a species, we've done so much damage in the name of progress. And this is something I didn't really, when it comes to a wetland setting, didn't really appreciate until I worked in my river restoration job. And so when I was going to site visits, and this was as me as an experienced biologist and conservationist, when I would go to site visits and I would go around, you know, with the different managers and they'd say, now this, do you realise that this river has been straightened? And do you realise how many, like the extent to which our ponds have been drained? And suddenly the way that you look at your landscape is just everything around you you just see the history of it and pretty much you know so many of the canals and the rivers and everything that's in concrete you, you just see it for what it is and I think people are starting to wake up to that and to realize okay we've gone this far on our journey to industrialization to urbanization and we can't push it anymore um and Yes, conservation and practical habitat management in a kind of defined way is really, really necessary for some habitats, but there's a real beauty and a real joy in reinstating nature, reinstating animals like beavers who can engineer it for us because they can do so many of the things that we, you know, it, that we can't do. They can survey an area and figure out what needs to be done just through pure instinct. Um, and so it's just really, really magical. And so yeah, we see so many people coming to heal, talking about what they've learned. You know, they've read Feral, they've read Wilding, they've read all these different books and they and they look at their landscape differently and they see what it was. And it can never be that again, but it can be something different. And I think beavers are an amazing tool to getting that something different. And it's really great that the public are fully embracing it. Yeah, fully embracing it now. Indeed. And um Emily, as an academic with students, and you've been in this space for a while now, um, what what are the challenges now? So it, it's kind of it, you know, it's fairly um, straightforward, I guess, to get the public interested in beavers. It's I defy anyone not to find them an interesting, weird species to to learn about. There's just so many amazing things about them. But your research into beaver wetlands as firebreaks was amazing and it has so many interesting applications. Um, but what's next? How do we, how do we go further to, to kind of get the attention of the people who can make those decisions, whether it's in the States or in Europe, so that you know the, the right people wake up and listen and understand the facts? I think one of the biggest both challenges and necessary things to do to move forward from the academic side is fill in the data gaps because beavers as a restoration agent, beavers as a partner in climate change, these are all very new topics. And there's a lot of very fundamental questions that are just missing data and haven't been looked at. And so in my own research, it's like half projects where I wanna push the frontiers of science and really like live the, the academic dream of adding my own little nugget of knowledge to the sphere of greater knowledge. And then the other half is like, okay, nobody has collected any data on this. It's a very low hanging fruit project. It's just, it needs like, gotta put the time into it. Um, and so students have been awesome in that regard because a lot of these projects are perfect at the undergraduate, at the master's, at the PhD level to get a student on it, get working on it, get some really incredibly valuable data that doesn't necessarily need to have, you know, super, super advanced laser spectroscopy, like mind boggling techniques. It's like survey the ponds. How many do we have? How much water is actually being stored in them? How much carbon is actually sunk out in every single beaver pond every single year? And how many beavers did we have? What did the landscape look like before? That would be like the best we could possibly shoot for in the future. But again, you kind of not have to have any people on the landscape to have full beavers on the landscape. So what is a realistic restoration goal? And to answer all those kinds of questions, there's just so much 
fundamental data that needs to be collected. Stuff about beavers and fish, that data has been collected for a really long time, but only in the last five years or so have the papers come out that are just abundantly clear. And they're just like, fish can get over beaver dams. They evolved together for millions of years and it's all good. Um, and just like that kind of clarity in the data has been missing historically um, and is super, super important going forward because when you are working with policymakers, like I would lose them in exactly five seconds if I started pulling out the methods section to any paper. They don't wanna see that. They want clear results, clearly communicated. Um, and then as scientists, when you do a study, like when I did my fire study, really setting aside the time to talk to people about it and to explain it because people do have questions. And if you did the study, you're the expert on the study. So you need to answer those questions. You can't just publish it and then leave it in the academic tower and go on to your next project. Like really take time to talk to people. And that's how I think you can make your research a lot more impactful and actually get some traction in the policy sphere instead of just dying in the, the academic sphere. That's so true. Um, James, as Director of Conservation for WWT, um, you must be well aware of the challenges that lie ahead um, in not only climate change, but, um, you know, wetland restoration. Could you maybe shed some light on, you know, the, the hurdles that you're uh, facing and maybe the things you're doing to overcome them? Yeah, it's, um, it, it is a big challenge and we, we face that across the conservation community for whatever we're, we're trying to do, but I have a huge amount of hope. Because I think, you know, based on the science that we gather, the passion and the interest of people, which I think is growing in terms of, of how to manage our, our environment, then, then I have a massive hope that, you know, some of the, the, the challenges that, that have, have happened, uh, we, we can put right. So, you know, I, I think there are so many, you know, still threats to our, our wetland resource in the UK and beyond. Um, you know, we still see the impacts of, of, of drainage, we still see the impacts of pollution, we still see the impacts of disturbance to some of the wildlife that, that are in those wetlands, you know, there are a wide range of different problems. But for every one of those problems, there are solutions as well. So, um, you know, between governments and uh, NGOs like the, the ones around this table and, and academics, you know, for me, it's about getting people to work together and especially to get us working together with, you know, people who work the land, who use the land for other different reasons other than, than nature conservation and trying to manage those conflicts and, and issues together so that we can realize what I think everyone wants. You know, I talked earlier about, you know, the challenges of water quantity in, in the UK, you know, in, in a few decades time, water quantity is gonna be a big issue for us in terms of our supply. And that's going to be the same for the landowning community who are going to need water for their land as well as people needing it to, to, to drink and, and wash and, and, and some pretty basic things. So it's finding those solutions together. And, and I think, you know, in, in relation to beavers, where, where this comes into play is, is, is what you mentioned at the beginning, I think, Sophie, is that in, in England, um, I think this kind of push for a, a, a beaver strategy where we can bring everyone together, uh, you know, behind something that we can really see is the future for, for beavers delivering a catchment scale across the country then I think we're in a really really good place and let's learn some of the, of the lessons of, of, of how other wildlife schemes like this have, have maybe not gone so well in the past and let's not make those mistakes let's talk to those people whose land we are going to see beavers on and, and let's let's talk and let's come to those solutions because I'm pretty sure they're out there. That's so true. And Rasheen, you know, you know, probably better than most people, the importance of taking the time to really listen to people who are going to be affected by these things. And, you know, landowners and farmers are not only um, might be affected by having beavers on their land, but also with climate change and ask any farmer and drought is probably one of the biggest worries that they have on their mind. You know, in the early spring in April this year, we had 10% of the average annual rainfall that we should have had. And then we had one of the wettest Mays on record. Um, what is it, what, it, what, um, what do you find uh, that farmers want to sort of get out of a conversation with people, you know, from conservation groups. Um, why is it important? We sort of answered it already, but it'd be good to hear from your personal experience. Um, I, I, I think they want to be listened to and their concerns taken seriously and 
potentially not dismissed uh, because as I say we're in this transition and I think as society we all have to look at how we are managing our land and you know you know, it's a collective decision as well I think um, I don't think it's a choice of beavers and farming or anything like that I think there's definitely solutions out there but it's uh, to me the whole I guess situation it's not about focusing on beavers as such I think it's how we manage our rivers and how we're managing our water and off the back of that beavers will benefit and I think society will benefit so I mean taking things for example I mean we can still see it you know farming close to the water's edge sediment going into the system and then being lost out the sea and these are the kind of ways I think beavers can help but also if we look at, at how we're managing our landscapes and go okay pull back farming have buff natural naturalized buffer systems that even if you didn't have the beavers in that situation I think we could all probably agree as society is a better way forward for managing the land you know for a whole host of different reasons of chemicals running into the system uh, saving conserving our soil things like that off the back of that the way I see it is well if we did that then your conflicts with beavers are definitely reduced so it's like a you know it's, to me it's double positives all, all around um, and sometimes I feel it can be more difficult to have these situations or these these conversations if it's purely a discussion about beavers <laughs> because sometimes that can bring up more controversies about how beavers got here should they be here you know so it's almost the whole focus of the arguments gets taken away from going well do you know what everyone why don't we just look at how we're managing our land here um so i find going into these kind of situations it's you know very important to listen see what the farming concerns are and it's not just farming but fishing concerns come up as well i mean i i don't farm i don't fish but i need to understand where these conflicts are coming from if i can be helpful in this kind of push to change how we manage things and i can bring in the beaver ecology and say well listen if you set aside that part of your land or if you let these banks naturalize well then you wouldn't have those beaver issues which is why i'm here in the first place but i think it's about pulling back and society going like we all need to make this collective decision of how we're going to manage our land and you know instead of almost sometimes pointing the finger we could take a step back and go well are we going to subsidize people or are a society we're going to say do you know what we want our river banks to look completely different um and help people move back um and from these uh, water resources i think and it's about storing land, uh, water on the land as well i think you mentioned earlier on i think sometimes people are afraid when a big wetland appears and um, so it's about helping people make that transition of do you know what that was never um that was always a wetland historically and if we really intensely farm it there's there's so many other consequences but we have to give people options and room to move we can't just say right pull out of farming that's it done um so i think yeah wider society decisions probably not all focused around the beaver but uh yeah it's the beaver's definitely sparking i think these conversations a bit faster yeah it's a good hook for sure um Hannah do you have any anything to add on Rasheen's point about um you know restoring things at a landscape scale um and looking at how we our, our relationship with the land I suppose I just want to echo um people just need people are starting to look at the landscape differently and understand it for what it is so they got understanding now generally more that messy equals good and tidy doesn't necessarily or good and also that green doesn't necessarily equal good either that diversity is the key um, diversity of habitats is key and without diversity of habitats you don't get a diversity of species so I think that message is um, is definitely building in people they understand it more and more and now I think we've got a real challenge but a, a good opportunity to show people that biodiversity is linked to climate change so messy doesn't just equal bees and all of those lovely creatures, it equals climate change mitigation as well. And that's something that's really important. And that's kind of why we um, picked this topic for the webinar tonight, because we talk loads about, you know, beavers and how they impact the ecosystem, but have we talked so much about climate change? So I think it's a really exciting emerging area of research and something to follow closely. Definitely. And um, Emily, I think it might be helpful for some of our audience who might not know what a beaver wetland actually is um, to describe kind of what's there you know what species can they find it obviously in the states it might differ in terms of the specific plant species and stuff but maybe just 
a summary of what it's like to, to be in a beaver wetland and the sounds and kind of the feeling of it? Yeah, um, it's great. It's uh, a better question is like what's not there because it really is the watering hole in the landscape. And I've got game cameras up at some of my sites and we see bobcats and literally every kind of duck I can imagine. I don't know enough duck species to name them all, but it's like, they're definitely different kinds of ducks. Um, and we've got wood rats, we've got otters, we've got muskrats, we've got the beavers themselves, we've got all sorts of different herons, we've got, you show up and the sounds of the birds are so intense and so loud because there's so many of them that I'm actually starting a research project now just on the side with a student that's like, can you characterize how different a beaver wetland sounds than other types of wetlands just because of how much stuff is going on there. You've got all these animals, you've got the water being diverted into all these different side channels that the beavers have dug out with their little paws. You've got water trickling over the dam, through the dam, around the dam. These aren't permanent, like impermeable structures. Water can get through beaver dams and you can hear that and you can hear the breeze is being attenuated in the different willows and trees that you've got cropping up all around. It's just such a completely different ecosystem. And especially out where I am, which is a pretty dry place, uh, you'd be walking towards the beaver pond and everything around you is like dirt and quiet. And maybe you hear the cicadas or the flies buzzing. And then you get into the beaver wetlands and it's completely different. And it's always like that. Like it doesn't matter if it's hot and dry. It doesn't matter if it's rainy. It's always there because there's such resilient structures. and. The water that comes into them is slowed down and all of the power and intensity of floods is metered out. All of the stress of drought and heat is metered out and you just have this patch that's just there and it's reliable and it's resilient. And that's why things like bears and mountain lions and all of these incredible rare creatures will come to beaver ponds because it's there year after year after year, it'll be there. It's a reliable source of water. It's a reliable source of food. If you ask our bobcats, they eat all those different ducks. Um, but it, it's just an incredible place to actually see a patch of wilderness, even if it's just like a quarter acre big. It's a little bitty patch, but it is a true patch of wilderness in a lot of these beaver ponds. No, that's amazing. And I think it's a really important point to end the discussion on in terms of, um, you know, we're not asking for enormous swathes of wilderness. Um, you can get a, a big difference and you can get carbon sequestration and drought and flood mitigation from a small patch. It just has to be diverse and rich. Um, so, okay, thank you so much. I mean, we could talk about this for ages, but we won't. Um, it's time for a five minute tea break now. So uh, we're gonna wrap this up and then come back at 10 to eight, so in five minutes. Um, and Jan is gonna lead us in a Q and A. So maybe while you're making your tea or going to the loo, whatever you're doing, um, have a think of some questions and we will spend the next, half an hour after that answering them with the panelists. So um, see you in five minutes, everyone. And I'm gonna have another go at sharing my screen and showing a film, wish me luck.
Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a nice cup of tea or break, glass of water, and um, welcoming back the panel who are coming back in. Great discussion, really good. And we have lots of questions. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, Sophie and possibly Hannah will be helping um, sort of look at the questions and put, uh, put them, some themes together. Uh, and I'll ask whichever panelists might have the right answers. So first question um, from Barnaby Briggs of um, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Um, for you, James, no pressure then. Um, do we have an idea yet of how big the beaver impact could be on the scale and quality of UK wetlands and beyond that on CO2? So general beaver impact on the wetlands and carbon dioxide sequestration, I guess. I think at the moment it's probably how long is a piece of string. So um, uh, we, we know uh, very much about the, the benefits that, that beavers can um, can create. Uh, I mentioned some of them, them earlier, um, and that includes, you know, improving biodiversity, storing carbon, you know, dealing with floods, water pollution control. You know, they, 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 these are a long list of benefits that these animals can provide. So, I think quantifying that across the whole of the UK, I'm not sure I could give the answer here and now, but you know, it's certainly something that I think we need to to factor in. And one thing we do know about wetlands is that they, in terms of an investment, they're, they're pretty good. So there's a bit of work done well, about five, six years ago by um, uh, the Natural Capital Committee. They, they, they did some work to look at what the value of creating new wetlands would be. And they came up with figures looking at the economics of it, that uh, these wetlands could be you know, up to nine times what you spend, you get back which is a pretty good return on investment. So if you multiply that up, you know, economically over a vast area of land, uh, then you, you are getting really significant benefits. And I think we'd need to look at that kind of, you know, the environmental, the social, but also the economic benefits that these animals could play, because it could really be very significant. Um, and Barnaby's got a supplementary, really, which is which is starting to frame the possible data. Um, can we say yet, or will we be able to say in the future that um, X number of beavers could create X hectares of wetland and 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 uh, be responsible for reducing CO two emissions by X amount? So, if if we don't have that, do we know of anyone working on there? You know, is that sort of thing that is being? And maybe Emily might know from the US if there's any kind of ratios or you know connections between beaver numbers and those sorts of results? Um, well, we have models where we can estimate how many beavers a landscape could hold in theory. And then with looking at all of the beavers and all of the ponds that we've studied in the past, we know the population of beaver pond sizes and beaver dam sizes. And so you can come at it like from a very back of the envelope kind of way and say, okay, well, if we had a thousand beavers and the average size of a beaver wetland is, you know, one square kilometer, then we're going to get a thousand square kilometers of beaver wetlands with these thousand beavers. Um, and that's fine until you start uh, wanting to do things at like the individual scale, because whenever you're doing these broad landscape scale statistics, like you are smearing over all of the details and you're just saying at the landscape scale, we're going to get this much. But in this pond, that could come out to be a teeny tiny pond. And you don't want to get somebody all hyped up on how big their beaver pond is going to be. And then it winds up being this little dinky thing. Um, and similarly, you don't want someone to be thinking, oh, well, the beavers are only going to make this very small wetland here. And then it winds up being huge. Um, and so, yes, we can say like at the scale of a country or at the scale of, you know, a huge watershed or region or a basin, we can estimate how much beaver activity could happen in that area and how much carbon could be stored and how much water could be stored and how much acreage could be preserved during droughts and fires. But um, it does break down as you get to the finer scale. And at the finer scale, it, it is very much like you have to have the site fully assessed individually to make that kind of, it's like there's, there's 40,000 variables in every model. And when you 
from the beaver model, you've got ecology, biology, geomorphology, hydrology, like every ology you can imagine is at play. Um, and so to get that really specific answer, you got to get a lot of really specific information to start. John, can I just come in as, I mean, I, I think there are some probably some hidden benefits out there as well that, that actually could be really important. So putting wetlands back into the farmed landscape, uh, some research that we're doing at the moment, we're looking at these things that we call subsidy effects. So what is it doing to, to other kinds of biodiversity? So we know now that putting wetlands back into these farm landscapes can have a massive impact for things like farmland birds, which are another thing which has been in decline in recent decades. But perhaps even more interestingly, they can be massively beneficial to pollinators as well. So, you know, it's the way that our landscapes are built or rebuilt to provide these sorts of habitats and ecosystems for these types of organisms. You know, we're only just starting to learn what these benefits can be, but we know that they're going to be massive. And also worth uh, just asking Rasheen, if you're ever asked about that, that sort of data, do people come and ask simply do from uh, they could be people who are who are in the who are professional conservationists or they could be members of the general public but are people curious about uh, do they ask about effects of beavers on um decline on co2 for example do they not even understand that connection yet um i would say it's growing i don't think there's a direct connection i think Beavers are still so new, new for us um, that I think people are looking at it as a kind of scattergun approach going, oh, could they do this? Could they do this? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if um, I think someone's mentioning about research gaps. But I would say echo everything Emily said, but in a British context. And when we first really talked about bringing beavers back, and that was like the mid 2000s, we brought it, brought them over officially. Um, there were so many questions back then. And it's almost... I looked back then at the questions people were asking and it was, you know, impacts on trees and um, will even survive in Britain. And I guess we can look back at these now and go, well, maybe that was silly back in the day, but we also had to prove it in a British context. So all these questions about carbon are definitely starting to come up. Water storage is a huge issue and there's already lots of research. So you look at Exeter University, you know, people are really starting to look at this. There are effects on biodiversity. Um, we, we all know this, we know beavers are good for biodiversity, but again, it's about, um, people are really fascinated about, well, what does this mean in a British context? And some people are very species focused, so they could pull out things like, you know, freshwater pearl mussels or aspen. And I wouldn't say sometimes there's a panic, but sometimes they're like, oh my goodness, you know, we're bringing back this species that ha can have landscape changes. It hasn't been here for, you know, 400 years. What will that mean? to you know, my patch over here or this species over there. And I think it, it's a bit of a political um, push as well to say people sometimes are afraid of change. And I think beavers represent something that people can't control. So there's almost a bit of a panic plus excitement to go, well, could they do this? Could they do this? Um, so I think the research opportunities for beavers are vast and people are starting to make these connections. And then from a reintroduction point of view, I mean, my area of research is looking you know, at beaver diseases, parasites, um, th these kind of beaver health, which you know, until about 10 years ago, we, we had no clue in Britain. Um, so the opportunities are vast and I think people are starting to pull the connections together, which is really exciting uh, from a research point of view. And while Emily may be able to, or either you, Rasheen, or Emily may know, but one of the panic areas I think people see is, is trees chopped down. So they think, well, if, if beavers are taking trees down, doesn't that negatively affect sequestration rates? Um, and, and that's only part of the beaver effects, obviously. But um, can, I, can anyone here speak to that question of beavers taking trees down and, and therefore that sort of creating this idea of that they're not helping with uh, climate change? I can take a, a first stab at it. So when you're talking about trees helping with climate change and why planting trees is a good thing, it's because tree growth is really important. To grow tree biomass, they have to suck a bunch of carbon dioxide from the air. When a beaver comes in and it chews, um, it has evolved with these trees for millions of years. And in many cases, when it chews the tree, that wood gets stored on the floodplain or in the dam or in the lodge. It's not immediately rotting. It's being put into an environment where that carbon is still locked up in the biomass for the most part. And that tree stump is going to start sprouting because these trees have been chewed for millions and millions of years. Like if not beavers, other things did chew these trees for a long time. 
Uh, and so it'll start sprouting and each of those sprouts is going to then need to suck more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to grow. And there's some research that's been done that shows when you have a riparian forest that is being coppiced, it's being chewed by beavers, it ultimately is more dense, it's more biodiverse, it's more lush, there's a lot more tree biomass in it than if you just let this forest grow and be old because when it's old like we don't have mile high tall trees like they stop after a while the growth really really slows and so you get the most of this sort of carbon drawdown effect when you are getting rapid tree growth and to get rapid tree growth you got to clear out all the undercrap you got to clear out all of these trees that have kind of reached that late stage and they're ready to go be part of the floodplain dead woody debris deposits um, and so it's good that they're chewing if they weren't chewing we wouldn't see as much carbon pull down wow that's a cracking answer that we can all use with great enthusiasm. That's great. Thank you so much. It must feel really strange, Emily, that we're all so unfamiliar, relatively speaking. Obviously, Rasheen um, is very familiar, but uh, compared with you over there who have beavers in the hundreds of thousands, I imagine. Um, right. I so answer the next these question questions for everyone here, too. Yeah. So it's not <laughs> like, don't even worry. <laughs> So, and um, we have a question from um, Ellie Anderson, probably for you, um, Emily, actually. Do you have any data in the States about groundwater recharge linked to the presence of beavers? Um, seen a couple of papers and interested if there are more recent ones? Uh, yeah, without knowing the specific papers, um that this person's seen already. Uh, I don't know if there's more recent ones. There is data supporting this. It usually comes about when beavers are brought in in a restoration context. And so there's a stream that's in really poor shape and beavers either come in by design or they show up um, by accident and they start damming. And these sites were already instrumented to monitor the restoration. And what you see in these sites is the groundwater level rises. And this is really, really prominent in the Western US where it's very dry. Um, and I would guess that these results would be paralleled in drier parts of Eurasia as well. Um, but it, I mean, it makes sense. They're slowing the water down. The water is stuck on the landscape. Um, dirt and soil and rocks are porous. And so water can seep in if it has enough time. And when you have your streams going super fast, there's no time to seep in. And so you don't recharge the groundwater as quickly. When you have it, that stream dammed and you're just slowing the water down, you have a lot more time for it to seep in and to become sort of that spongy groundwater. And we have both like true deep groundwater recharge where it's going all the way back down into the aquifers where it could be pumped out in a well somewhere. Then we also have a lot of shallow groundwater recharge and that's like in the root zone of the plants and that buffer layer of one to two meters of spongy soil, that's what can help keep these systems um, green and healthy and happy even during droughts and fires. So yes, there's plenty of data on it. Um, it can be kind of challenging to find sometimes, but it does exist. And sticking with the water theme, a question from Anne Rees, and um, perhaps Rasheen, you could um, pick this one up. Um, Anne says, I think beavers need flowing water and trees. How many trees and how much land on the side of the water to be available? So it's just generally thinking about uh, suitable areas for beavers. Yeah, um, uh, first thing I would say, beavers are so adaptable. I think um, sometimes I show pictures of, of where I, I trap and relocate the most beavers. And I think people are like, oh, um, just to emphasize, these are not a wilderness species at all. Um, beavers can be quite happy in the backs of people's gardens, in a, in a park, in utility areas. And where I'm often working in really flat agricultural uh, landscapes and drainage channels where you know the water's this deep and there's no trees for for a long time so i think it's about shifting i guess some of our preconceptions because you know we look at all these lovely pictures from canada and norway and beavers are living out in these vast forests and lovely you know icy cool lakes beavers will move in um, to the smallest of ponds and the thing about beavers if it doesn't quite suit them they will make changes to make it suit so i would say you definitely have beavers on standing water and um, so it doesn't always have to be flowing now whilst i would say it's not about that they don't need trees but you know britain we're, we're quite a mild landscape really um, and a mild climate so beavers can um, really live in areas with very few trees and I think that has surprised people especially coming back in parts of Scotland and um, of course if you give them the choice they will prefer to be in woodland and you know I must emphasize this is not Norway and it's not the extremes of um, in North America where the tree capacity and availability really does limit beaver spread 
but in Britain we are a very mild climate and basically any vegetation you will see along the banks beavers will be feeding on them so we see them on brambles grasses now if you're putting them back and if I was choosing a release site we would not choose these kind of sites but beavers are moving in here um, themselves so if you're looking at a site to potentially move beavers or encourage them to come back in you, you want um, like Emily said you want these native tree species that have co-evolved with beavers for millions of years so you want your willows that are you know more water loving anyway that will coppice so well and will actually be more productive when beavers start feeding on them and um, so it's not our beaches and all these maybe non-native trees that when beavers move into rivers for example where you've got about three trees <laughs> that are big mature trees and there's no understory coming up then of course the beavers head to those trees and i think that's where our mindset is that they look destructive but if you've got a healthy bank system with a scattering of shrubs, beavers will do very well there. And um, yeah, that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your outlook. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. That's a great answer. Um, back to Emily again um, from Chris Taylor, who is a HEAL volunteer, but also um, a, a somebody in academia who studies ecosystem carbon. So Chris's question for Emily is, do we know how much carbon could be sequestered? And crucially, could gains in carbon storage be offset by the emission of more potent greenhouse gases? Great questions. Um, we have some ideas about how much carbon can be stored. Uh, I was just doing some back of the envelopes calculations for a project I'm writing up and the best estimates that I've seen come from the Rocky Mountains. And so if you are not in the Rocky Mountains, like take that with a grain of salt, that this might not be a direct analog to your system. But when you had the beavers um, and creating these beaver meadows over time, these places stored about seven times as much carbon as what would be near the river without beavers. So if you had a more of a grassland state, so you're getting about seven times as much carbon storage. When it comes to emissions, a lot of people get very nervous about methane emission, um, because we know that some wetlands can produce methane. But if you were to draw out the full carbon cycle of a wetland in its like full restored and healthy state, while you do have fluxes going up of some greenhouse gases, your fluxes coming down uh, do typically outweigh those. And so at the landscape scale, you are going to see these beaver wetlands acting as a carbon sink. Um, they're going to be pulling that carbon down definitively. If you stick out your methane meter, you might get a little methane signal coming up, but that like to destroy that wetland or to abandon that wetland because you're nervous about that small signal would mean that you lose the huge pull down um, that maybe is not being measured. And that, from my perspective as a scientist, has been one of the biggest um, flaws with a lot of wetland studies in general, and especially beaver studies, is just measuring a part of the system, whether that is carbon or water or ecology. If you just measure this one tiny thing and you say, oh my gosh, these beavers, like they chewed the heck out of these beech trees and they didn't grow back. And like, how sad was that? Um, you miss all of the willow and you miss all of the aspen that are totally fine being chewed constantly. Um, and so when you're reading any study, um, definitely contact the authors if you're unsure of what something means. Most scientists are happy to talk about their work or our egos are through the roof. We love hearing that people are interested in our stuff. Um, but do like pause and take that step back and say, is this the full picture or is this a part of the picture? Because if it's just a part of the picture, you gotta go find the other pieces of that picture out there. Um, so yes, you absolutely are gonna get emissions from a wetland. You're also going to have massive carbon sinking. Great, so the big takeaway from that is Beaver wetlands are a carbon sink. So, that, and 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 to this idea of um, of thinking about partiality and that you mustn't rule out all the other things. That's excellent. Um, I think this one could be for you, James, um, from Chris Jones, Beaver Trusts. Chris Jones, thank you, Chris, and hello. Um, so far, with the honourable exception of Napdale of Napdale, beaver restoration has been a gift by NGOs the landed gentry and crowdfunding. Is it time for the taxpayer to start investing in this incredible function multiplier? Oh, brilliant question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, I think it, it's important that we get some steer from the state about what should happen for beavers. It's, it's not good enough just to be sat on the side and and, you know, saying yes or no to a variety of things, you know, it has to be a more strategic approach. And, and that's what a variety of organisations have been calling on for the last, you know, 
probably two years now is to say that's important. So I am heartened actually by some of the things that, that we're hearing. Um, so we know that uh, BEFRA interested in policy, that Natural England are interested in strategy and we'll be seeing some, some movement on that soon. Um, and the other thing that, of course, that we know, uh, which was announced last week, was it, um, was that the Secretary of State said that uh, he wanted to put together a kind of a reintroductions group to sort of tackle some of these issues where we can bring all the right people around the table and say, right, OK, how are we going to do this? So I think there is um, there's a real case for the state intervening, but they might not be the whole of the, the story. So. I think there are other mechanisms out there. You know, I think, you know, there's kind of state payments and paying, you know, landowners public money for public goods, you know, that, that weaves into this as well. But, you know, there may be some opportunities for, for landowners to be able to think about more innovative ways of financing, you know, the introduction of beavers, where they can get a return on that investment because of the services that they're providing. So I would say, let, let's be creative. Let's think outside the box a bit on this and let's look at all those different different areas. But, but going back to the question, we desperately need a strategy because you know, we can't ha end up with how we've, we've kind of ended up at the moment where we've, we've got quite a lot of kind of beavers in the landscape where maybe they shouldn't be. Well, that's fine. Well, let, let's solve that and let's put something in place that gets us into the best place uh, with people like Rasheen and various other experts on, on this area really having their say and getting this right once and for all. And the uh, with the co well, the pandemic financial burden, I think it's it's going to be really interesting to see whether the climate change agenda um, and the Beaver's contribution to it overcomes the sense that budget's now not available. Um, I don't yeah, know. And I, I, I think, Chan, as well, you know, the environment isn't just till November 2021. Yeah. Uh, you know, COP26 is what everyone's building up to, but it's got to go beyond that. This has to be the start of the, the, the next step, not, not the end of, of this, this piece. And it will be interesting to see if beavers feature at COP26. I don't know if they will. Do, do, does anyone here know if beavers are going to get a look in? No? <laughs> okay. We might um, try. Yeah, <laughs> you go for it. You, if anybody can do it, you can, Sophie. Okay, oh, uh, how are we doing for time? We're okay for time. Um, and back, thank you very much, James, for that. Does anybody else want to make a, a remark about tax, you know, the public fund, the public purse essentially backing beavers? No? Good, okay. Um, uh, back to you, um, Emily, there is a question about, um, uh, let me just see where it is. Yes, does the prevention of, this is from Matt Hughes. Thank you, Matt. Does the prevention of wildfires by beaver ecosystems lead to quicker recovery of the surrounding area too? That is an excellent question. Theoretically, yes because you have preserved a patch of mature plants that can recolonize out from that patch. The more patches preserved, the less distance between um, burned, ready to be sort of reset landscape and uh, mature landscape. But as I said, there's so many data gaps and this is one of those data gaps is that there's a lot of theoretical models for why it should. There's data that tangentially supports that. Yeah, of course, I mean, look at all these great native species that sprung up by the beaver dams, but there's no uh, robust scientific studies currently that have shown, yes, these patches are absolutely a nucleus for recolonization in the surrounding landscape. Um, definitely something on my agenda, uh, definitely something I know on the agenda of other beaver scientists. And it's these kinds of questions that uh, I wish there were more beaver scientists out there. So if you are considering becoming one, I strongly recommend you do. It's a surprisingly small field. Like I'm pretty sure I know all the beaver scientists that there are. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all like, it, it's not like we can all fit on a standard Zoom license phone call, like it's not a huge group. Uh, and so whenever there are students coming up that are interested in this, like I highly encourage them stick with it. There's so much room in the field for you to make your mark because there are all these questions and people want answers um, and you can only answer them so fast. Um, I mean, you can answer them with these conceptual models and theoretical models, but people want data. Um, and so that data is not uh, existing in a way that is easily packaged currently. 
Oh, that's really interesting because we're so much smaller as a country than you. So I imagine it's fingers of one hand, <laughs> there'd be some beaver science here. But it's a really, if you can come at it through a climate change lens, for example, um, it's a really interesting thing to straddle the species and, and that topic uh, if you're carving a career. And it might be one of those jobs that people didn't realise existed. Um, so now I have a question for you, Hannah. Um, is there any way uh, that I, as a total layman, a civilian, can help in reintroducing beavers and brackets? Thanks so much for a fascinating event. So any way that people can help? Um, so we have kind of talked before about the fact that kind of the majority of reintroductions are done by charities and large landowners. So naturally, the chances to practically help with a reintroduction are small. You know, if there is your someone in your local patch is reintroducing beavers, they might have you as a volunteer, but the chances to practically go out and do something are very small. So you have to be a bit creative with the ways that you're going to input. Um, and so, you know, one of the main things you can do is support Beaver Trust and Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust and any other charity that has an interest in wetlands or rivers. And supporting them doesn't always have to be donating. It can simply be following them on social media, subscribing to their newsletter and just keeping up to date with what they're doing. If they are speaking to government and there's a petition, help them. If they want you to write to an MP, do that. Those little actions might not feel like a lot, but they are a lot. Like we rely on these things. We rely on your help to get our voice out there. Um, but I suppose if, that kind of isn't really enough. Um, one of the other things we say to people as well is, if you're brave enough to, to do this, just start conversations with people. You know, start with your friends and your family and the people you know and see what people think. I mean, my family know that I'm from a conservation background and it's my life, but yet they, the other day when I brought up beavers, oh, it's an absolute no. Beaver reintroductors is an absolute no. So that's a really interesting conversation to be had. So if you can, that's really important, spreading the word. Um, but if you really want to do something practical, you really want to get out there and get muddy, you might not be able to help reintroduce beavers, but wetlands really need your help and wetlands really need volunteers. So my last job, I was doing river restoration projects and that was amazing fun. It was, when we were out, we were in waders up to this far in a river, helping to restore the banks, building new like berms in the banks, all these different things that you can do. and. Those projects are really important. All those wet, wetland restoration projects are important because you're helping to restore the habitat that one day beavers might be able to return to. And so if the habitats are degraded, the beavers aren't going to want to come to your local area. So it's about being creative and seeing how can you help a related fields? If you don't have beavers nearby, what can you do to help similar organizations? That's what I would recommend. Yeah, great answer. James, is there anything you want to add to that? Because obviously it spoke to, you, to the work that you do and, and and I know you have volunteers helping. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Hannah said it all really. I mean, there are lots of opportunities and ways in which people can get involved and, and looking at the websites of those organisations around, around here, you know, you, you will find opportunities to do that. So get involved and, and find ways of doing it. But um, I mean, one of the things I, you know, I was going to say later in, in this session was you know, we can all be human beavers as well. So um, the things that we can do, you know, in and around our houses can be massively beneficial to how water is managed in the landscape. So putting small rain gardens next to your downpipes from your house, you know, learn how to do that. It's great. It manages, you know, what might seem to be a very small kind of uh, local flood problem issue for your local neighbourhood. You can actually make a big difference by doing that. So have a look at wwt.org.uk and there's loads of information there about how you can create a mini wetland uh, and you can become a beaver too and you can learn more about just what these wonderful animals are doing than you can do a bit yourself. And what's really interesting about that is it's a sort of gateway into a topic and children would love to be a beaver. I mean, absolutely love to be a beaver. And, and of course, we must tell everybody they don't eat fish, which is, and I mentioned to Sophie and Eva Bishop from um, Beaver Trust that in the Narnia books, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are fish eaters, <laughs> would you believe? And Narnia is, a, in the UK, is very widely read. So um, there is some adjustment of, <laughs> of uh, perception going on here. Um, so um, got time for one last question, do you think, Sophie? Uh, yeah, sure. go for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So this one is for Rasheen and Emily. 
Giving rivers the space they need to breathe will obviously help be beavers and thus the river system's ability to function and build resilience towards climate change. In your experience, how proactive are landowners in increasing the marginal buffer between their land and river or creek systems? Should we start with you, Emily, Jenna, and then come to Rasheen for the specifics of the UK? Uh, in terms of sort of getting landowners on board, especially with the idea of letting a river kind of run amok on the landscape, uh, yeah, I think there's been a lot more interest and success than you might think, given the way that I just phrased that situation. Um, especially with ranchers, I found a lot of ranchers who are very pro beaver or pro uh, riverscape restoration because they have cows or goats or whatever out on the landscape and they want to eat healthy grass and they want to have um, sort of just a stable place for their animals to live. And when your river is like cut down this small and nasty, like you don't even want your cows in that. Um, and so a cow can walk through a wet floodplain, that's fine. Um, so I see a lot of ranchers and a lot of people that are more on the sort of grazing side of things be all about it. And they're like, yeah, let's restore this river. Let's make it so that my cows have more land and more grass to eat. And I get whatever like environmental or economic benefits come with that. Sounds great. Uh, it's definitely a tougher sell when you have someone with hard infrastructure like buildings or um, crops like farmers. Uh, you can definitely get a lot of farmer buy-in on this. They're, the conversations I think just need to be a little bit longer because with cows or something like that, you raise them for a couple of years. Um, and so, you know, it's a longer term sort of perspective on a crop of cattle. But when you've got a bunch of kale or lettuce, like we grow out here in California, you know, you flood that crop, that's a short lived crop. Like you have lost that investment um, if it dies. And while it is true, you'll have better groundwater, you'll have more nutrients in the soil, you'll have all these great things if you let the beavers do their flooding, that doesn't change the fact that you just lost a huge crop. Um, and that's very stressful. And so I think that's, uh, a longer conversation to have and you really have to have the buy-in because it's a change that's scary when it happens and you've got to be prepared to like wait that out. If there are government benefits that can help offset those um, initial losses that can be huge. If you can have people installing flow devices so that maybe instead of losing the whole crop, you just lose a quarter of the crop and that you know pro con benefit gets tipped in the favor of riverscape restoration. Um, that can be really, really important. Um, but overall I am seeing a lot more interest in it, especially when you have floods and droughts and fires really in the forefront of people's minds like that, at least out here, like fire is so much more stressful than a, a beaver on your land. You're just like, whatever, like if it's not going to burn, let's just try it. Um, and it, it's a little sad that we had to get to that desperate of a situation for people to embrace riverscape restoration, but it is what it is. Got to work with what you have. Great. And we're just about running out of time, but if you could just add Rasheen, a, a short contribution um, to, to top up what Emily just said about landowners and marginal buffers. Yeah, so I'll, I'll very quickly paraphrase it and you know, it's very different extremes. I would say river restoration is growing arms and legs here and people are very aware of the concept, but we maybe don't have these big fire events. So, but drought is a growing concept in Britain for sure. Um, we're a very small place. And where we want to be in these lowlands, wetland systems and we've drained historically, it's where the beavers want to be. We've got lots of historic flood banks and beavers, or people get very scared when beavers and flood banks come together. And I would just quickly add, we're also on this drive to replant lots of trees. And I think people are, again, are seeing beavers and trees are not compatible. So I think we've got a lot of hard selling to do, which we should do. Um, and that I think is gonna really help the message go forward. Cause I think right now there's a bit of a misconception. and people are going, well, trees are good, rivers are good. Um, and we need to bring it together to benefit uh, beavers back. So I think people are still a bit scared of this change. Thanks very much. I'll hand to you in a sec, Sophie, but just to say that last question was from Tom Gray. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. Um, excellent answers, really uh, enriched the first part and uh, very, very interesting to hear everyone's uh, knowledge and experience and, and views. So, um, Sophie, um, hand back to you for a, a wrap. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, yes, gosh, that was so interesting. and. Um mine's racing a little bit and I think it's always the way isn't it when you have a webinar like this you're sort of dumped with loads of information and you're kind of 
surprised and mulling over a lot of things that often you're left sort of feeling like oh what can I actually do about it or what's the take-home message because there's so many big things to think about here so maybe if we go around the panel I'll just I'll just pick on everyone and everyone can um, if you're from an organization like WWT or HEAL maybe give an update as to things to look out for in your calendar over the next couple of months and maybe things that people can get involved in but maybe if there's a take-home message or something to think about that might be helpful for our audience so I'll go first from Beaver Trust. Um, it's kind of an update really. So we're hoping to get an update from the government on the English Beaver strategy, which would uh, be really important um, and it's very much needed at the moment. So if you want to stay up to date with what's going on there, if you just subscribe to our newsletter, which comes out quarterly, the next one is coming out in July. It's free, it will come straight to your email inbox um, and maybe subscribe and listen to our podcast, The Lodgecast, which is a very kind of, light-hearted and informal way of talking about lots of these conversations and we have some great guests on there too and we're just about to start our second season so that's a bit of fun um and we're starting a buff a river buffer campaign later in the year as well so all of that if you subscribe to our newsletter you'll get all of that information straight to your inbox um jan and or hannah how about what's going on with heel uh, okay so um we are, we've just had our first birthday at Heal, so we are just one years old and we are on track to acquire our foundation rewilding site in the south of England by 2022 or sooner. And so we're doing this through a combination of various different funding streams, going to corporates, but also really importantly, going to people and asking for their support. And we have a very unique funding system which enables people to really be tied into the land. Um, and our whole you know, reason for being is to give more land back to nature. So to create more sites across the UK where reintroductions can happen safely, where there won't be these, you know, these areas for conflict because actually these are going to be safe places for wildlife. So if you would like to help beavers as an action for World Environment Day, we would encourage you to sponsor a square of land at Heal site. So with Heal 3x3, you can sponsor a three by three meter square of land. It will have your name tagged to it. When our site opens, you'll be able to come and visit it and you'll be able to see over time how that square of land changes as it rewilds. So that's from us. Um, thank you very much. What an amazing idea, thank you. And Rasheen, maybe it might be helpful um, as a bit of food for thought for people to know what beavers are doing at the moment, what's going on in their, in their breeding season and what should we be aware of when we're hoping to see a beaver on our local river? Yeah, well, the beaver calendar is quite busy at the minute. So this this is the kit. Um, so beavers are breeding at the minute. Um, it's the time of year the kits are born in the lodge or the or the burrows. Now you won't see them anytime soon. They usually stay in three four weeks, um, maybe a bit longer. So, but the summer evenings are very long now. Um, so it's a brilliant time to go watch beavers, and you can do that obviously stand back do you know countryside codes everything else but if you want to see beavers as a start being a good time of the year and if you're lucky enough to live near them i would say go go walk in the countryside in this kind of this time of night um, and you should see them um, and look for kits in the next i guess few weeks to month time so yeah cool and uh, thank you emily what's going on um over there in the states and what should people be aware of or looking out for in the next few months uh, people should just always keep their eyes on all these different great beaver webinars. Uh, I think that I've seen a lot of really good information coming out of them and lots of great speakers. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I know I tweet about them a lot on Twitter. Um, beaver Trust does as well, for sure. So sign up. Most of them are free. You learn a lot. You get to meet the scientists. Um, and then just one pro tip for anybody listening who is a student, like stick with it. When I started in this field, uh, every study I've done so far, people are like, that's too simple. That's not like a study people are going to be interested in. Um, very incorrect assessment. People are definitely interested in it. Uh, so if you have an idea and you're like, I should study this, uh, stick with it. Chances are it actually does need to be studied. That's very good advice. Um, and James, what's going on with WWT? Yeah, well, it's our 75th anniversary this year, so there's a lot of um, things happening. But one of the big things that we're doing uh, this year is stepping up our campaign on the thing that I mentioned earlier, which is around the blue recovery for the UK. So we're really going to be stepping up and ramping up pressure to ensure that you get all sorts of organisations and people to be part of this, uh, you know, um, push for 100,000 hectares of new 
were created wetlands across the whole of the UK, you know, putting wetlands back in the landscape. It's a big, big issue for us. And, you know, as, as someone who was born in a town called Beverly, because there used to be beavers there many years ago, I'm very passionate about making sure that beavers are part of that. And we'll be joining with the Beavers Trust uh, to make sure that this concept of the beaver strategy is actually realised and we see beavers back in the landscape um, and, uh, you know, really doing all the fantastic things that we've heard today. And if there was one thing I was going to suggest that people do, apart from making their mini wetland in their garden, is get outside. Find these wetlands around where you live. They'll be full of life at the moment and you'll just have an amazing experience. So I hope people will learn a bit more about wetlands tonight. They'll go and see that wetland and understand a bit more about what these wonderful habitats do for them as well. Yeah, very good. <laughs> OK, well, thank you guys so much. It's been such a fascinating discussion and I think the audience has got a lot out of it. There's a lot of chatter going on Twitter and social media. And um, just to let you know that this recording will be made available online, so you will be able to watch it again or share it with your friends and family um, or your social media audiences if you like what you've seen and you want other people to hear it too, that would be really good. And make sure that you follow Heal, Be The Trust and WWT and of course, Emily Fairfax and her incredible research, which is just so interesting. And I'll be watching that very closely. Um, don't forget about World Environment Day, which is happening on Saturday, 5th of June. And um, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming and let us know if you enjoyed this evening because we might do this sort of thing again. It seemed to work really well um, and have a lovely rest of your week and happy World Environment Day for Saturday. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, everyone.